Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today and welcome to the 33rd session of Midlis Al Khunji. Today, we are back to our business and economic discussions and another interesting topic talking about the evolving tax landscape in Oman, focusing on Oman economic updates, updates on administrative and direct tax matters, compliance obligations for the automatic exchange of information under the common reporting standard, GCC VAT updates and challenges, GCC excise tax expansion. Let me introduce our guests for this session from Ernest & Young, Mr. Alkesh Jushi, Alkesh Jushi, sorry, tax partner and MENA Energy Sector Tax Leader, Mr. Metal Patel, Senior Manager at the Indirect Tax, Ms. Lemia Al Ghafri, Assistant Manager at the Excise Tax and VAT, Mr. Mihir Asher, Assistant Manager at the Business Tax Advisory, Mr. Saeed Al Ghaifi, Associate Business Tax Advisory. Welcome to Majlis Al Khunji, and over to you, Mr. Alkesh, to start the presentation. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, uh, Riyam, for that uh, introduction. And, uh, you know, just uh, uh, I, I really want to take this opportunity to thank uh, Majlis Al Khanji, uh, you know, Mr. Khalil Al Khanji, and the entire team at uh, Majlis Al Khanji who have made this uh, a, a possibility. Uh, you know, when I last attended the uh, session on Oman cricket, uh, I felt that, uh, you know, this would be a good platform for us to come and share, uh, you know, some of our knowledge about, uh, you know, the economy and, uh, you know, share what we believe uh, is something very good for the future of the country. So, you know, without much ado, uh, just a very quick introduction about uh, about my team. So, you know, Mithul Patel is uh, a senior manager with us. He is, is British and, uh, you know, four years back, uh, he chose to uh, come to Oman. Uh, of course, uh, you know, he had no idea uh, that he was uh, coming to uh, a desert because the pictures that I had shared with him, you know, kind of presented to him that he is coming to a very green uh, and, a, and a heavenly place. And once he was here, I'm sure he realized that those pictures were absolutely uh, true to the point. Uh, Oman is by far uh, a jewel uh, in, the, in the GCC. Uh, from landscape, from culture, from economic perspective. So he has uh, chosen to make Oman as his home and he will be covering the VAT uh, areas. Uh, you know, we have uh, Mihir Asher, uh, who is our assistant manager. He's been with us for the, in the firm for more than 10 years now, uh, has been, uh, you know, focusing on corporate tax, uh, advising some of the largest banks in the country. And I'm really, really proud of my uh, two Omani colleagues who have, uh, you know, joined us on this call to uh, share insights and their experience on uh, what we are seeing on the tax. Uh, Lamia al -Ghafri. she's been with us uh, for, you know, more than 14 years. She joined us, then she, you know, is about to complete her ACCA and then she has joined us back again. Uh, kind of makes me really proud that, you know, it was a, it was a good experience that uh, allowed us to bring her, bring her back to us. And then we have a young uh, budding talent with us, Saeed al Uh Saeed is a sportsman. Uh, he does a lot of running. Uh, and uh, sure enough, the number of tax updates are going to make him run even more. Uh, so it'll be really nice to have him share, uh, you know, something very important, which is the uh, common reporting standards, a new introduction for all of us. Uh, and, you know, how it is going to affect us when we make our declarations to the world outside. Uh, so, of course, I am the tax partner uh, based in Oman. I've been with uh, Ernst & Young for uh, 15 years now. Uh, but something very unique is I have been living in Oman for more than 35 years. Uh, you know, I'm the second generation in the country. My family came to Oman in 1965. And, uh, you know, that's 55 years ago. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've been really fortunate, uh, Alhamdulillah, as we say, uh, that, you know, whenever I talk to my family and my father, he tells me stories of uh, how life was in 1965 uh, during, uh, you know, late uh, His Majesty Sultan Kabus's father's time. And uh, certainly there was no tax. And uh, we didn't have to worry much about tax in those days. Uh, but here we are in, uh, in, in span of uh, 50 years. 
uh, we have uh, become uh, you know integrated to the international uh, community we have been integrated to the international economy and uh, naturally we are modernizing ourselves so we are talking about tax now so you know having lived here for so long uh, i very often introduce myself to my international clients as you know uh, as you know a lot more omani than what i look and many a time you know i do often say that i am now low money and uh, uh, oman is where you know i spend the best years of my life so uh, you know oman is very dear to me and uh, and hence i feel uh, that uh, you know tax and the taxation development that's happening is good for the long term future of the country and uh, you know in my in our session today uh, you know typically we are being told that uh, you know tax is generally a very boring subject uh, but uh, we will try to make it a little bit interesting uh, by sharing uh, my views on the economy and uh, you know how uh, our fiscal balances look like and how perhaps uh, tax uh, could contribute uh, as uh, an economic uh, you know activity generator uh, in the in the times to come so uh, let me uh, share uh, my presentation with uh, with all of you uh, and then we will uh, certainly take you through the uh, through the slide deck. Okay. Right. So uh, uh, let us start off uh, with our uh, session. The topics that we are going to uh, cover, and uh, you know, over the next about. I would say 70 minutes or so, we will cover these uh, five uh, you know, important topics. And then of course, we will have a Q&A session at the end and happy to take your questions uh, at the end. So if you could either post your questions on the chat box or if you can just note them down, uh, we will definitely uh, you know, try to respond to your questions at the end. So you know, we will cover our topics, which is the economic update, uh, the update on the administrative and direct tax matters. Uh, what is the automatic exchange of information agreement that the government has signed? And then, uh, you know, what does common reporting standards mean? Uh, clearly, there is a lot of media hype on the VAT and, and what really VAT is going to do in the future. And, uh, of course, the excise tax, which has been there for about a year now. Uh, and we are, we are anticipating a lot of expansion to happen in that as well. So let's move on. So coming to our, uh, you know, the fiscal analysis. So what we have on the screen, uh, you know, apologies if it's a little bit small uh, on the screen, but I will talk you through the uh, data points that we have on the screen. Uh, so, you know, this is the analysis of the budget uh, and the actual fiscal situation of the country. Uh, what you see on your left-hand side of the screen is a bar uh, graph, which sort of covers the the total income uh, you know of the of the government uh, the total expenditure and what you see there as a small graph uh, at the at 2014 uh, virtually you know difficult to sort of spot it on the screen is the deficit uh, you know with, where you know the expenses of the government are uh, greater than the income we generally end up reporting a small deficit so if you see the deficit from where it was in 14 uh, to uh, you know the deficit uh, you know, sort of skyrocketing or going to a very big number in 2016. And thereafter, it sort of tapered down and stabilized. And then it has remained uh, roughly around the 2 billion uh, real Omani mark. Uh, and that is where it, it currently uh, is. Uh, but, you know, all of these analysis uh, that we talk about are during the normal time when uh, COVID or the pandemic was not there. So, you know, the pandemic has thrown majority and in fact all of our numbers out of the window uh, so you know this is this period of about six months is a bit of an unusual uh, period so uh, i i don't think uh, comparing these six months with any period of the past uh, would be a fair thing to do uh, but then gen generally this gives you a bit of a trend of where we are uh, you know typically whenever i have spoken to people uh, they've expressed that you know why are we uh, reporting deficit numbers and what does what does deficit number really indicate? Uh, you know, deficit is not really a bad thing for the country because deficit kind of indicates that, you know, the government is aspiring to boost the economy by spending a bit more than what it is actually earning. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, all the developed countries uh, across the globe uh, do have, uh, at, uh, you know, some sort of deficits which happen uh, in their fiscal balances. Uh, the real question is, when we are having a deficit, are we having sufficient support from the international community to fund those deficits, uh, either by way of borrowing uh, in the international community or by way of us being able to utilize uh, from our reserves which we created in the past. Uh, and typically, the government has uh, been doing a phenomenal job in the last uh, you know, five years or so of balancing it by you know, borrowing as well as utilizing the reserves that have been created. In Oman, particularly, we have not been very uh, used to seeing deficit and hence, you know, deficit kind of gets people worried a little bit. Uh, but then deficit is not really a bad thing as long as we are able to fund the deficit. Coming to the to the right hand side of the graph is the oil price uh, movement. And these are the actual oil price uh, movements. We've been tracking this for the last 15 years. Uh, you might not find this data uh, anywhere because this is something that EY has been tracking uh, based on the data that got published by Ministry of Oil and Gas on a monthly basis. So if you notice uh, from 2006, uh, uh, the data points that we have, you had an you know upward movement in eight, and then again a collapse, and then a continuous upward movement for the next five years, uh, and then again another collapse. Thereafter, a slow inching upward, and then it has sort of tapered down. So we've got the 2020 budget, and the 2021 forecast, which was uh, you know earlier forecasted to somewhere be around sixty dollars. Uh, of course, now. Uh, due to the pandemic, uh, the, the situation has completely changed uh, and we are witnessing somewhere around the $44 uh, current oil price at, at which it is being, uh, you know, sort of trading. So, you know, if you see the oil price movement, it kind of, uh, you know, indicates that uh, we've been going through an extreme uh, volatile period. And with that kind of a volatility, it becomes very difficult to predict as to you know, which uh, direction are we uh, progressing towards, particularly from an income perspective of the government. On the right, uh, on, sorry, on the left side, you see the green uh, graph. It kind of indicates the percentage of oil and gas revenue uh, for the total income of the government. So if you see the oil and gas revenue percentage declined in 2017, 18, 19 it sort of went up and then now it has started declining again is also an indication of the government's initiative to slightly and gradually diversify itself from oil and gas uh, you know at, at one point we had almost 80 percent of the government's income coming from oil and gas uh, and you know as we are heavily dependent on oil and gas when when the price is so volatile our income uh, uh, you know becomes a very difficult thing to uh, you know, our budget becomes a very difficult thing to balance. So, you know, this is uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, sort of information which I wanted to share, which allows us to set the context uh, in, in the right perspective as to why are we talking about tax today? Uh, you know, we've been consistently reporting deficits uh, and the government needs to diversify its income sources in order to be able to balance its fiscal budget. Uh, moving on from there, uh, you know, we thought there were some very important uh, highlights uh, for FY uh, 2020, which I just wanted to quickly touch upon and, uh, you know, sort of share our, our views on. And uh, absolutely uh, spot on at the, at the beginning, while we, when we were, uh, you know, waiting for more participants to join, we, uh, you know, discussed very briefly about, uh, you know, some significant changes which have happened in the last, uh, you know, one month or so. And, uh, you know, the 28 royal decrees which got issued uh, during the course of last week, uh, perhaps uh, is unprecedented in many ways. Uh, I don't last remember when we had so many royal decrees come out in, in one go. Uh, these kind of changes, uh, although uh, in slightly smaller uh, scale in, uh, you know, its magnitude, did happen in 2011, you know, when we had our own uh, small version of the Arab Spring, uh, we saw some very big changes being made, uh, announced uh, by late His Majesty Sultan Qaboos. Uh, but then we are now witnessing 
a completely new era uh, for us uh, for the future. And uh, for me, uh, I mean, having witnessed, uh, you know, a lot of economic activity over the last so many years, uh, I, I'm extremely optimistic and positive uh, of the direction which the government has taken, particularly the direction, uh, you know, the uh, effort that has gone into consolidate, the effort that has gone into reduce the overall cost of running the government, the effort that is going in to, uh, you know, modernize how services are being delivered to the citizens and the residents in the country to, uh, you know, bring in new blood, to bring in new way of thinking is all step in the right direction. Uh, and that is where I, I feel extremely positive about how we are moving in the future. Uh, the Tanfeed program, uh, you know, we have been saying uh, for a long time that the Tanfeed program is uh, the program which was designed to uh, introduce the economic diversification. It is now much more relevant than ever before when we have the government uh, direction as well. Uh, where we want to diversify from our traditional oil and gas, uh, contributing to a very large uh, portion of the government income. The five sectors which were identified in the Tanfeed program, I, I still see so much of action and activity happening in those five uh, sectors that clearly that is what is going to be your economic engine of the future. Manufacturing, logistics, tourism, fisheries and mining. Uh, and clearly, these five sectors are are going to be, uh, you know, the area of focus for the government, the area of focus for the international community as well. Uh, you know, I just attended a very nice session about two weeks back from uh, the Dukum Special Economic Zone. And I was so impressed to see the activity that's happening on the ground and the number of businesses which are being attracted uh, towards, uh, you know, this uh, uh, this region. I, uh, you know, I was on an international uh, seminar where uh, we were debating and we were discussing that how we could possibly make Dukum an automobile manufacturing hub, not only for the GCC, but an automobile manufacturing hub for the African uh, subcontinent, as well as uh, the high uh, economic uh, growth, uh, the Asian high economic growth sector, where, uh, you know, Automobiles could actually be manufactured in Dukum and the shipping lines which have been set up could help uh, send uh, the automobiles to, uh, you know, the, uh, to, to, to the Asian uh, high consumption areas as well as to, uh, you know, the African continent. So, you know, imagine if we could bring Volvo, Land Rover uh, and uh, the likes of Tesla to, uh, to Dukum to manufacture. Uh, you've got 30 year of tax holiday, customs exemptions, uh, you know, much cheaper energy cost, uh, which is, uh, you know, a, a big uh, source of, uh, you know, consumption in the, uh, in the manufacturing of automobiles. And you've got the supply chains of, uh, you know, aluminium and uh, steel uh, happening within the country. You could actually create a very large, nice ecosystem for the automobile sector to grow. You're now having buses uh, which are going to be supplied for the FIFA World Cup uh, going to be manufactured in Dukum. Uh, so Dukum is, is certainly an area which is likely to create a lot of opportunities for uh, the economic activity and the economic generation in the future. The five royal decrees, uh, or I would say the recent royal decrees that got issued in 2019, uh, particularly the commercial companies law. Uh, the commercial companies law got amended after 47 years the earlier commercial companies law was, was introduced in 1972. Uh, and then we had the new one now in 2019, uh, which is really modern. It allows a single person company uh, and uh, you know, it has introduced a lot of other provisions which modernizes the commercial companies law, much more easier to establish uh, companies. The foreign capital investment law, again, a huge boost. Uh, we are now allowing 100% ownership into several sectors uh, with an intention to attract foreign capital, uh, foreign direct investment. Uh, so, you know, uh, these have been uh, building blocks for the future as, as how we look at it. And certainly we will see much more uh, benefit uh, and the economic activity getting unlocked out of these, uh, these royal decrees, uh, these laws which were introduced and amended. I won't spend much time on the excise tax because excise tax will be covered by my colleague uh, Lamia. Uh, but 
clearly excise tax uh, and VAT were both GCC initiatives. Uh, they got introduced in almost all the, uh, you know, uh, GCC countries, the excise tax in particular. Uh, and, uh, you know, we just have now, I think, uh, uh, one country which is yet to do it, and I'm sure they're going to do it as well very soon. VAT uh, has been introduced in three countries and uh, has been there for the last almost two years uh, uh, now. And uh, clearly they are seeing a lot more activity happening out of, out of VAT. For us, VAT in Oman has uh, been on the cards and has been on the discussion for a long time. Uh, and uh, VAT is now uh, you know, coming to sort of more of a reality because the law has been passed by uh, you know, Majlis Shura. It has gone to Majlis Adavla. And it is still under debate there. Uh, but last week I was hearing that it is uh, it is also one of the document which has been forwarded to the to the palace for consideration, uh, and we will hear more about uh, more about VAT. Uh, you know, VAT we typically uh, uh, sort of look at it from a very negative perspective. Uh, uh, you know, but VAT uh, is a consumption tax, and from an economic uh, and social perspective, it's a it's a good uh, you know tax which level plays uh, all the uh, you know uh, citizens because the more you consume the more tax you pay uh, and there are a lot of areas within vat which are either zero rated or exempted so the basic items uh, you know are not taxed uh, and therefore uh, you know a middle income family a middle income household uh, you know they spend a lot of money on healthcare education and food uh, and these are either zero rated or exempted uh, therefore uh, you know the uh, the tax contribution from a middle income family is not so much uh, uh, whereas uh, the tax contribution from the uh, you know the upper strata of the society is more so you know you start creating a level playing field from a social perspective as well vat uh, is there in 130 odd countries it's not uh, something new vat contributes about 47% of the eu's uh, total collection uh, and the total budget income uh, so you can imagine how much of a contribution does VAT make to uh, to the uh, EU's uh, total collection, and that then allows uh, you know the countries to spend on uh, the social development programs, infrastructure, and so on and so forth. So VAT per se is is not that bad. Also, you know, as a as a tax professional, what I'm witnessing in the international community and in the, in the international space is gradually governments are slowly moving away from corporate tax and income driven taxes to consumption driven taxes such as you know customs duty uh, vat excise these are all indirect taxes which are ta tax which is applied on the commodity or on services uh, you know when you start taxing the commodity and the services uh, you only tax based on what the consumption is happening and not based on what the income is being earned by the uh, by the either the individual or the corporates so that then allows enough money to be plowed back back into the economy uh, through investments. So, of course, we will cover much detail on VAT in the VAT section. The big development, which is the Oman Investment Authority, uh, you know, establishment is, is a massive, massive uh, development. Uh, you know, I've been, uh, you know, an advisor to uh, the Oman Investment Authority, as well as those 15 assets which are moving over from Ministry of Finance to Oman Investment Authority is paving way for you know the government reducing its involvement in running uh, government company observing across the globe as well where the governments are now slowly divesting and moving out of companies allowing the companies to be run by private sector so that you allow the ecosystem for innovation you allow the ecosystem for efficiency to be brought in and the government then takes a back seat and becomes a facilitator for the economic activity to take uh, to uh, you know achieve its fullest potential so Oman investment authority establishment is a step in that direction and once you have those 15 government companies come underneath it you've already started seeing a lot of new appointments happen at the board level the boards of uh, uh, of all these companies are getting rehashed and rejigged uh, with an objective to bring in more modernization and bring in more, uh, you know, private uh, participation into these companies. The Oman Investment Authority consolidated, my view is that it is going to create an economic giant. 
So we're talking about roughly about $100 billion uh, asset book of Oman Investment Authority. When you start adding the Oman LNG, Kalahat LNG, OQ, uh, Omran, Oman Aviation Group, and you start adding all the other giants, uh, the, Asi uh, the Asiad Group, which is uh, owning the Oman shipping, you start creating a massive ecosystem for uh, you know, the uh, efficiency to be brought in. And that is what is going to happen in the time to come as, as the, uh, you know, the authority starts uh, you know, taking control of these assets. So moving on, uh, you know, very quickly, I will share with you the, the Vision 2040, which was uh, you know, set up. And, uh, you know, and I mean, this now shows the wise leadership of late His Majesty Sultan Qaboos that the head or the person heading the Vision 2040 was, uh, you know, at that time, His Highness uh, uh, Saeed Haitham, uh, now His Majesty uh, Sultan Haitham uh, bin Tariq. And, uh, you know, he uh, came up with some very uh, strong uh, indicators, uh, which we, uh, you know, are, uh, I've just summarized some of the ones which were, uh, you know, sort of very attractive and I wanted to, uh, you know, sort of talk a little bit about it. And one particular one is you see the bottom on the bottom, the third uh, uh, from the bottom, which is private sector investment and international cooperation, which generally is measured based on the ease of doing business. Uh, we were 78 out of the 190 countries which are monitored by the World Bank. Uh, we want to get to the top 20 by 2030 and the top 10 by 2040. When this was introduced, there were a lot of people who were, uh, you know, either skeptical that these are realistic targets or not. Uh, but I, how I looked at it was that if you aim higher, uh, you will at least get somewhere closer to it. And being uh, top 20 or top 10 is not impossible. It is definitely achievable. Uh, it is more achievable when you have the government will to make it happen, as well as when you have uh, now the modern day technology which can allow us to uh, you know, achieve some of these uh, aspirations. If we move on from there, of course, uh, you know, the 2040 vision, uh, which was uh, you know, uh, talking about uh, you know, the several areas which uh, are going to be the enablers, uh, some of the ones which I thought I would, uh, you know, just just plot them down here for us to, you know, have a have a quick uh, talk through. Uh, I just br I briefly mentioned about the Dukum free zone, and I truly believe that the free zones which are there, the Sohar free zone, Dukum, Salala, uh, are going to be your economic uh, engines uh, of the future because they are going to attract more and more investments into these uh, into these uh, areas. When we talk about you know, the Kazain Economic City, the Madinat al Irfan uh, project, uh, you know, cities, mega cities being created within the cities with uh, a lot of modernization. Uh, these are, you know, going to meet the aspirations of the future generations and therefore will become uh, attractive enough to bring more investment into the country where, uh, you know, the, the younger generation would like to come live here and, you know, build uh, their future as well as you know, achieve uh, the purpose of their lives. Uh, these are clearly going to be uh, the, uh, you know, the future magnets, uh, as, as we call it. The uh, oil storage facility in Dukum, people generally don't talk much about it, uh, but uh, that's a huge step. And based on my information and my knowledge of that project, uh, you know, that project was conceived and envisaged to be, uh, you know, the economic uh, uh, sort of, I would say, a facilitator to transport oil uh, from the locked areas uh, into that terminal and from that terminal to be sold, sort of to negate the Strait of Hormuz, uh, you know, threat, which is a very small 11 nautical mile uh, stretch through which 80% of the GCC oil is being shipped. Uh, you know, so the oil terminal in Dukum is going to be of huge strategic importance in the in the times to come. Uh, Moving on, uh, when we look at the current times, uh, you know, COVID-19 uh, uh, threw a lot of challenges at us. And when we look at the COVID-19, what I would like to also see is the silver lining around it is, uh, you know, I'm observing how the government responded to it. Uh, you know, we can be very critical of many things, but then there is so much of positivity, which is also there out of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, there has been loss of lives and definitely that is going, that is not something that we want to see in the, in the country. 
But the positive aspects of this, which I notice is that the speed at which a $20 billion economic package was announced by the central bank clearly set out a message that the uh, government is acknowledging the crisis and the impact of the crisis on the economy. And the announcement of the package kind of gave a message that, uh, you know, they, the government is willing to support uh, wherever there is a need uh, for the support re required. There were announcements around the postponement of major fees. Uh, you know, the, uh, there have been reduction in some of the charges being charged by the government. Uh, and, uh, you know, many of the technological aspects got unlocked. Uh, and you can see now digitally a lot of services being delivered to us. Uh, I don't last remember when I could uh, renew my Mulkia sitting at home on, on, a, on a tablet or on a, on a, on a phone, uh, which has now become possibility. Uh, I would say there were a lot of these developments on the card, but these just got accelerated uh, due, to the, uh, due to the pandemic. Uh, the deadlines for the tax return submissions got extended. There has been a lot of sub, uh, exemption as well as suspension on payment uh, deadlines for the taxes, exemption of tax fines uh, and penalties so that, you know, giving more time to the affected businesses to, uh, you know, manage their cash flow and liquidity and pay the taxes. Uh, a major, uh, you know, uh, circular was announced by the Ministry of Finance about four weeks back to all the government bodies, uh, setting out clear priorities of what they want to see in the 20, uh, FY21 or 2021 uh, fiscal budget, in that they've clearly given some direction around how to prioritize projects and what are the priority areas which the government, which the Ministry of Finance would like the other government bodies to focus on. Uh, so moving on from there, uh, you know, coming to uh, the tax and uh, the administrative uh, announcements which were made, I thought it would be useful for me to share all of this with you, you know, sort of fairly quickly so that you understand, uh, you know, where we are coming from and what are the areas which are uh, going to be, uh, you know, affecting a lot of businesses in the future. Uh, you would have read a lot about the tax card uh, system being introduced uh, recently in the newspapers. Uh, you know, the tax card uh, is uh, sort of a like what we have an identity card or a resident card for people in the country. So now every single taxpayer in the country is expected to have a tax card. Uh, you know, tax card is not a physical card, but it's a state, it's a sort of a certificate which is announced by uh, or, uh, you know, provided by the tax authority. Uh, and, you know, the tax authority gives that uh, a fixed number uh, to every taxpayer in the country. Uh, you know, this is going to be a number which is going to now get quoted everywhere uh, across uh, all the areas. So the government will then be able to consolidate the data uh, coming out of various areas like the customs authorities, the VAT uh, and the contracts which are being awarded by the companies to foreign uh, suppliers to local companies. You will then be able to create a data set at the back end, which will allow the government to consolidate. Uh, and to have a clear view of the economy as to which areas are growing and which areas require more stimulus and support. So this tax card uh, is effective 1st July 2020. It has a validity of two years. Uh, and this it's a very simple application. You can make it online uh, on, the, on the tax authority portal. You pay your uh, small fee and the tax uh, card gets issued. Uh, this tax card number uh, is required to be mentioned on all official documents uh, of a taxpayer. Just the way we were mentioning the MM number and the CR number, you will now have to quote the tax card number underneath it. So wherever you quoted your CR and MM number, you will now also be required to quote the tax card number. There are some penalties and uh, you know fines introduced, as you can imagine, because they want people to, uh, they want to encourage people to apply for the uh, for the tax card. So this is live as we speak. So any of you who don't have it, I would encourage you to go and apply for your businesses so that this uh, can be used in the future. Moving on from there, I thought I'll just quickly summarize, uh, you know, what is the uh, income tax law all about? Uh, there are two tax systems in the country. Many times people are not uh, fully familiar with it. So I thought I'll just quickly share. You have the corporate tax, which is applicable to companies for, uh, you know, the profits that they make. Right. So that tax is at 15% of the net profit that you earn. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, there uh, people 
often say that the government is not doing enough for the SME sector. Uh, you know, many don't know that there is a special tax rate of 3% uh, of the profit, which is applicable for small enterprises. Uh, the small enterprises, uh, they have set out certain criteria. Uh, if companies fulfill those, if those small taxpayers fulfill those criteria, they can actually apply for the 3% tax regime so that they end up paying only 3% uh, as the tax uh, for the profit that the small enterprises are earning. So that is the corporate tax regime. You have a withholding tax regime, which is what we call as tax deducted at source. When local companies and taxpayers in Oman are making payments to foreign companies, they are required to apply the withholding tax and deduct 10% from that foreign payment. And once they have deducted that, take that money and go and deposit it into the uh, bank account of the government. So typically, uh, these tax, this tax is introduced to bring into the tax net those foreign companies who are doing business in Oman, earning income from Oman, uh, and uh, you know not paying any tax in the country. So the government uh, in the income tax law has defined which are those criteria on which withholding tax should apply when they're making a foreign tax payment. So, you know, royalties, uh, which includes uh, you know, the trademark license fees. So, you know, today if you uh, have a Microsoft license or if you have a software license that you use for your businesses, when you're making the license fee payment, you're supposed to apply a withholding tax of 10% on that. Uh, so royalties uh, is, is that. Consideration for research and development. So if you're paying any money for getting research and development done outside, you're required to pay a 10% withholding tax on that payment. Uh, consideration for the use or right to use computer software. So, you know, it is covered in royalty, but it is also covered externally. So if you are develop, if you're engaging a software vendor who is developing a software for you, you're supposed to apply a 10% withholding tax on that. Fees for management or performance of services. So if you are making payment for management services outside, uh, then, you know, you would be required to apply 10% uh, withholding tax on that. The government in 2017, they amended the income tax law and added performance of services. So typically, you know, contracts which were being awarded to UAE or to, you know, any other near neighboring countries where, you know, we were uh, awarding contracts for services. The UAE companies were coming to the country, performing the services uh, and, you know, not paying any tax in the country. Uh, they were competing with uh, the businesses in Oman. And, uh, you know, the businesses in Oman were actually not being provided a level playing field because the, uh, you know, the foreign companies were not paying any tax uh, either in Oman or in their home country, particularly if there was a favorable tax regime in their country. Whereas the Omani companies would invest in localization, would invest in paying the corporate taxes and all. So their value proposition or the proposition at which they bid for contracts was not uh, equal. So this withholding tax introduction on performance of services is designed to create that level playing field. So any company who's delivering services in Oman is now uh, you know, subjected to withholding tax of 10%. And then dividends and interest. So, you know, if foreign shareholders are earning dividends or if foreign shareholders are providing loans or foreign lenders are providing loans to institutions in Oman, uh, and when they are earning income, uh, they are required to pay tax in the country. The last one, dividends and interest, uh, is, is a bit of a tricky one. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if you are attracting foreign investment into the country, why would you want to tax the foreign investor? You want to make it more easier for the foreign investor to come in and, and invest in the country. So, you know, 2019, a royal order was announced, a royal order was issued, suspending uh, the withholding tax on dividends and interest for a period of three years. Uh, so we are at the moment living in the middle of that suspension. Uh, so there is no more withholding tax applied on dividends and interest uh, for a period of three years. So it was announced on 6th of May 2019, so it is there for a three-year period. The government is then going to review whether we, sh we should be applying it uh, or, or we should be, uh, you know, extending the suspension for a little longer while. So this is a quick update on the on the income tax. Uh, okay, so let's uh, move on to, you know, just a quick summary of where we are on the withholding tax. So you know, the total collection of the government uh, through corporate tax. Uh, so I'm, I'm not talking about the municipal fees that the government collects on customs uh, and customs duty. I'm not talking about 
uh, the fees that we pay for tourism uh, taxes. I'm not talking about the municipal fees paid on rental contracts. So if you exclude all of that, the collection of the government from just corporate income tax is roughly about 500 million Omani reals, and roughly about 100 million Omani reals is collected by way of withholding tax. So we're talking about 600 million Omani reals total collection. This is not a small number, uh, you know, when you are looking at managing your fiscal, uh, you know, balances. So tax is extremely important uh, for the fiscal. Uh, long-term sustainability of uh, of the government budgets uh, you know and the government has uh, the the tax authority has been focusing over the last three years on withholding tax extensively and uh, you know the uh, they want to make sure that the taxpayers in the country in, in the country are applying uh, the withholding tax provisions more accurately uh, because through that uh, you are able to get the foreign uh, companies to also participate in the nation building activity uh, you know, before I hand over to my colleagues, I just wanted to uh, leave you with a message that, you know, tax is not necessarily bad as long as it is correctly applied and as long as it is consistently applied. So, you know, when we look at the foreign uh, investors who come into the country, we, typic we typically uh, notice that they expect, uh, you know, certainty, uh, clarity and consistency in, in an income tax law. So we call this as the famous three C's uh, of an income tax uh, act. So, you know, when you are able to be uh, provide clarity to an in international investor, then you, you raise the confidence uh, of investment in the country. When you are able to consistently apply across the board, uh, then, you know, you uh, create a level playing field for everybody. And then, you know, when you add certainty to it, so you add predictability. So, you know, when an investor is entering into a new business or when, all of you are entering into new businesses. You expect that you should be able to predict that you know how much of a tax am I uh, going to be able to pay, so that I can then uh, you know make my financial projections accordingly. So these are the three C's we generally expect from uh, you know tax authorities, and the tax authorities are working on it at the moment. You know the ERP system of the of the tax authority is really a modern one, and there there, there is a lot of focus around how to make sure that you know we add more and more to uh, the modernization of how uh, taxes and the tax authorities uh, operations are delivered to the to the citizens we are now talking uh, with the tax authorities on introducing uh, electronic uh, review of returns faceless assessments uh, so you know the expansion of the tax base uh, is very important once the tax base is expanded you can overall reduce the headline tax rate further lower because the government is not intending to make profit out of taxes Right, so if we are able to balance our budget with 700 million uh, reals of Omani, uh, Omani reals of taxes, we are happy with 700 million. Uh, if we get more taxpayers added into the tax base, then the overall tax rate from 15% can go down to 10%. Because you know you want to collect only 700 million, you don't want to collect 1.2 billion and then make it more economically challenging for the businesses to do business. So I think right now the focus is to expand the tax base, get more uh, uh, people into the tax net by expanding the economic activity so that you are then able to, you know, create more opportunities, more jobs uh, and more, uh, you know, spin-offs into the economy. Uh, so with this, I'll take a pause and, uh, you know, I'll hand over to my colleague uh, Mihir, uh, who will take us uh, through the automatic exchange of information. Uh, you know, Oman has signed uh, you know, onto the, uh, you know, international agreements now. So there were four agreements which were issued in order to move the Omani, uh, you know, the rating, which was at the moment, uh, you know, we were put on the blacklist of EU uh, for as a non-compliant uh, jurisdiction. So the central bank, uh, you know, the uh, CBO, uh, the CMA and the tax authority got together and they have, uh, you know, agreed with certain minimum standards of the OECD in order to uh, get us lifted off the blacklist. So UAE and uh, Oman were on the blacklist. Both of them are now on the gray list uh, uh, because the CRS has been implemented and we want to remain on the gray list and perhaps move on to the white list very soon. So with this, uh, you know, I'll hand over to Mihir. Uh, Mihir, if you can please take us through uh, quickly uh, with your session. Thank you. Uh, Mihir, you are on mute. If you can uh, please unmute yourself. 
Thank you, Alkesh, uh, for providing enlightening and insights around the Oman economy and its evolving tax landscape. I will just uh, share my screen very quickly. Okay. Okay, uh, taking pointers from uh, the discussions which Alkesh was having uh, around the Oman economy uh, and the number of royal decrees uh, passed this year, uh, including some of uh, the royal decrees which are around the automatic exchange of information. Uh, so Oman has recently committed to tackle tax avoidance, uh, to improve coherence of international tax uh, rules and policies and ensure more transparent tax uh, environment. Uh, considering these commitments, uh, there are certain compliance obligations for uh, taxpayers in Oman, uh, currently in terms of uh, common reporting standards. And in future, we are also likely to see uh, certain additional compliance obligations, uh, such as the country by country reporting. And uh, all of these are based on the BEPS action plan, uh, which has been developed by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. In terms of uh, common reporting standards, CRS, we would like to take you through three points. Uh, first, what is CRS? Uh, the second, what has Oman been doing in terms of CRS? And third, what are the procedural requirements for companies or for taxpayers in Oman? And uh, what are the applicable timelines uh, for CRS reporting? So uh, coming to what is CRS, CRS is a standard which has been developed uh, by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development for automatic exchange of financial account information. It was developed in 2013 and has been effective from 2014 globally. Uh, more than 100 jurisdictions have uh, adopted the uh, standard uh, in principle uh, to automatically exchange information between uh, the tax authorities of these jurisdictions. The basic purpose is to have a globally coordinated approach to disclosure of income, whether it is for individuals or for organizations, uh, to be reported on an annual basis to combat tax evasion. CRS is also very similar to FATCA, which is the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act. I'm sure many of you may have uh, been familiar with FATCA uh, or even CRS in the recent times, because when we open the, uh, any bank accounts, whether it's for an entity or for an individual, we sort of have to sign a self declaration where, to declare what is our tax residency in terms of uh, uh, which country are we tax residents so that the financial institution who is holding the deposit of yours is, is likely to report the balance of that deposit or any reportable accounts to the other jurisdiction in which you are a tax resident. Uh, coming to what categories of taxpayers shall be affected by CRS reporting? Uh, in, in the standard, there are uh, four, finan four financial institutions which are included in scope. Uh, the first is depository institutions, which is the banks or other financial institutions which uh, sort of hold deposits for uh, the individuals or corporates. Uh, the second is uh, custodial institutions. So these are basically uh, entities that hold substantial portion of financial assets of uh, other investment entities such as funds, uh, etc. Uh, investment entities are the third type which are set out in the standard, which are mutual funds or uh, uh, in funds in principle that are doing investing activities on behalf of someone else. And the fourth uh, category mentioned is the specified insurance companies, uh, which are the companies that deal with uh, cash value contracts or annuity contracts. So products, the, the companies who would be having products such as life insurance uh, would be required to submit uh, CRS related compliance uh, to the tax authorities. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, what has Oman been doing for CRS? So Oman committed to CRS last year and uh, it committed with the da date of 1st July, 2019 for collation of data for new uh, account holders. And uh, the exchange of information is likely to happen uh, towards the end of this year between tax authorities. So the first reporting in substance, which would be done by Oman tax authority would be later this year. 
uh, the, the recently also the timeline for uh, the compliance deadline for CRS also passed, which my colleague Saeed will highlight more, uh, but uh, which passed recently on, on the 13th of August. So the taxpayers were obliged to report the data of reportable accounts by then. Several trainings have been held by the tax authority along with uh, regulators, uh, Central Bank of Oman for the banks in Oman and C Capital Market Authority for other financial institutions. To provide a legal framework, as Alkesh was just mentioning, uh, a earlier this year, a royal decree was passed, uh, where, which allowed uh, the, uh, I mean, it was, a, it, it, it signed the multilateral competent authority agreement uh, which is uh, sort of an international standard for the local tax authorities to share information uh, with the other participating jurisdictions worldwide. Uh, in terms of uh, the EU's list, which will be re which is visited twice a year. So in February, as Alkesh was mentioning, it was Oman was in the gray list. Uh, this is going to be revisited again in October. Uh, and it is October this year, and it is likely that uh, it, the, because Oman has taken steps around uh, common reporting standards and other international tax practices that are required, uh, there could be a, a revisit of uh, Oman's stature under this list. I would now like to hand over my uh, hand over to my colleague Saeed, who has worked with several local banks and financial institutions on CRS implementation, to provide us insights on procedural requirements and. Uh, insights into the timelines applicable for CRS compliance. Uh, thank you, Mihir. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, further to what Mihir was saying, there are certain steps to follow for CRS compliance or procedural requirements. We can identify them in three different stages. Firstly, the legal entity classification, whether it is a reporting financial institution or not, as discussed by Mihir in the previous uh, slide. If so, then it needs to identify those reportable accounts depending on the products available in that institution. And the last stage is basically the reporting stage. There are two ways to report it, manually through the portal or XML format. Moving on to the timeline, um, due to COVID-19, COVID there has been some extensions and which, which brought the most recent deadline to the 13th of August 2020, as mentioned by me here. It was originally extended from 31st of May, 2020, which is the first CRS reporting by financial institutions in Oman. Going backwards to 31st of December, 2019 on the timeline, review of pre-existing high value individual accounts holders must be completed. The differentiation between the high value individuals and low value is basically what the high value accounts have a balance of $1 million. And for entities, it's $250,000. Moving on to 31st December 2020 on the timeline, complete the due diligence on pre existing entity and lower value individuals, account holders. Also, Amount Tax Authority to exchange data with, juris with other jurisdictions in which they have signed the CRS legislation. Lastly, I would like to end with considering that this could be audited in the future. Proper documentation, such as self certification form from customers. AML, which is anti-money laundry, KYC documents, policies and procedures, and lastly, CRS compliance, are important in order to help an appropriate audit trial. We should be pleased to assist you if, if you have any CRS questions for myself and me here. That is all from myself. On to Mito. Thank you. Thank you, Saeed, uh, and good morning to everybody. Uh, just a quick re reintroduction of myself, uh, Mito Patel. I've been in Oman now for four years, and in that time, I've been very lucky to work with some of the largest businesses to get ready for VAT. Now, quite often, the, the main question that I get about VAT is, you know, do we really need it? Uh, you know, are there other mechanisms by which we can raise this money? And as mentioned earlier by Alkesh, the reason why so many countries in the world use VAT as a revenue generator is because from a government perspective, it's quite simple to administer. And the reason for that is because the taxpayer does all the administration collection assessment of the tax. And at the end of the month, they hand over whatever they've collected to the government. So if you compare that to other types of funding where you might need to, for example, pay interest, it comes across as perhaps quite a cheap way of raising money. 
From the government perspective, they just need to put in place uh, a team, uh, a computer system and a law. And once they have that, the tax is self-functioning. So if you look at the numbers, you know, we anticipate that perhaps VAT could generate, let's say, a billion dollars a year in revenue for Oman. But the investment required to administer that tax from the government perspective would be a fraction of that. So that's why countries around the world really do favor a VAT type system. I suppose the counter to that would be, well, yes, the, the, the literal cost of administering the tax is quite low, but perhaps the economic cost might be a little bit more. And I think the data on this is mixed. So if I take the example of what we saw in the UAE, you know, we saw housing rents, housing prices falling in the UAE when VAT was, was introduced. Uh, there's no VAT on, on housing in UAE. So what we can say is the introduction of VAT in some cases was quite neutral. In fact, in terms of prices, we did see some odd statistics. For example, the, the price of cars in general went down when VAT was introduced in, in UAE rather than up. So I would say that the relative demand effects as a, re as a result of introducing VAT are not as significant as perhaps uh, you know, reported. The other one is that uh, if we look to Saudi, Saudi have tripled their VAT rate from 5% to 15% within two years of introdu introducing the tax. So clearly the Saudi authorities are very keen on, on this type of tax. You know, if you think about the revenue generation in those two countries, uh, you know, the revenue generated in the first couple of years was significantly in excess of what had been anticipated. So I'd say in, in those two countries, it has been quite a successful form of re raising revenue. If we just come back to the question of, of the economy and households, and as Alkesh mentioned earlier, it is anticipated that the Amman model of VAT will be quite similar to the Bahrain model of VAT. And that would include a lot of exceptions, a lot of zero rates, particularly for those items which uh, you know, are really significant to your day-to-day -day life. So for example, education, healthcare, uh, government activities, basic food. These items are not intended to be taxed. So if we look at the way that the VAT law is structured, typically what happens is if you go through the VAT law, you won't find a list of items that are subject to VAT. The assumption of the VAT law that everything is subject to VAT unless specifically zero rated or exempted. A few other facets of the VAT law in Oman is that it won't necessarily apply to everyone. Uh, you know, it applies to anybody who is in business, first of all. Um, it applies to businesses that have a turnover of over $100,000 a year. They will have to be within the VAT net. Businesses that have a turnover above 50,000 have the option to then fall within the VAT net. This comes back to, well, whether you'd want to be or not, comes back to the structure of how VAT actually works. So the way VAT works around the globe is exactly the same. For businesses that are making sales, you will charge VAT on your sale. Uh, you know, the rate in demand will be 5%. You will charge that 5% to your customer, your customer will pay that to you, and you will deposit that with the government. On the purchase side, your vendors will charge VAT to you. You will pay that 5% VAT to your vendor, and you will get a refund of that 5% VAT from the government. And the way that works is every month, you will prepare a VAT return. You will add up all the sales VAT that you've collected from your customers. You will add up all the VAT that you've paid out to your vendors. You will minus the sales VAT from the purchase VAT, and that balanced number you will pay over to the authorities. So, you know, we have a timeline here and we anticipate that VAT will go live in 2021. And there's been a lot of talk about this. My view is that in the four years I've been here, there's never been as much noise as there is now on VAT. Uh, you know, there has been a lot of public announcements. We saw that the VAT law uh, was through the Shura Council. The Shura Council had certain comments to make it, then went to Oman Council. Uh, you know, we know very well that the Oman Council is, is very well versed on the provisions of that law. So I would say that there is a very, very strong likelihood that we will see VAT in Oman during the course of 2021. Uh, now looking very unlikely to be January, but certainly over the course, uh, we would anticipate it be introduced. Now, why is it important to know the date? It's important to know the date because from a business perspective, 
preparing for VAT can be quite a time consuming exercise. We have projects with some of the major government businesses in Oman that have run multiple years. And why is that? You know, I mentioned before, all you do is collect five from your customers or pay five, uh, receive five of refund for your purchases. It's because the VAT law is quite complex. So yes, it's 5% on sales, but that's only if your customer is in Oman. If they're in another country, we'll apply different rules. On purchases, yes, you'll pay 5% if your vendor is in Oman, but if they're in another country, that could be a different rate. And it can also be product specific, and it can be specific to exactly what your supply chain is. So VAT then becomes very, very complicated, and it takes an effort across the entire business to prepare. So if we look at the next slide, it gives quite a good indication of all of the complexities that go into preparing for VAT. And I'm going to focus in on five particular things that our clients tell us are their biggest headaches and that we've experienced as the advisor have been the most difficult to prepare. The first one is your software. So most large businesses will have an accounting software or an advanced ERP system to prepare their accounts, prepare their financials. Smaller businesses may use a solution such as Excel. But whatever your solution is, it needs to be ready for VAT because VAT is a transaction-based tax. So if you think about every sales invoice you issue, every line item on that sales invoice needs to have a VAT classification. Now, if you think about a medium or a large size business, you could be doing thousands and thousands of transactions per year. And you can't really go and have somebody manually decide what is going to be the VAT treatment of each transaction. So you need a level of automation. Now, for smaller businesses without so many transactions, you could have Excel, or it could be done through your, your point of sale system. For slightly larger businesses, you may have a, a bespoke accounting solution. Most of these accounting solutions now do have VAT content, but you still need to make that relevant for your business. And for larger businesses that may be on perhaps Oracle or SAP or an advanced ERP, there is a significant investment of time that needs to go into configuring those systems to be ready for, for VAT reporting. And as I say, the reason why that's so critical is because it's a line item issue. Every single line item on an invoice needs to be tax classified. And that's a very difficult thing to do if you have a complex business with complex supply chains. The second most important thing is to look at your contracts. So you may be a large business with multiple different types of contracts, different contract structures. You may have certain things you do which are even without a contract that could be just with a, a purchase order. Now, in the VAT world, what you really need to do is take a look at all these contracts and make sure you have the right wording in them to protect you from a VAT perspective. And one thing that we come across a lot are things like change in law. And our clients sometimes say, I have a change in law, is that good enough? And we say, it might be, but why not invest the time now to put a fully fledged VAT clause into your contracts? So later down the line, you're not worried about having disputes with your counterparties about, well, you know, what's the price that VAT is calculated on, who pays who, and what's the arrangement? You know, you could be a smaller business where, you know, you've taken up a contract with, with a larger business that's asked you to, to give them an all-in price, including taxes. And you might need to go back and revisit that and see, you know, is that clause now fit for purpose? So taking a look at your contracts uh, and, you know, all the different types of contracts you have is, is really significant. The third thing I'd say on the priority list is now when you buy things from, from local businesses, they will charge you 5% VAT. You know, if we look at the Saudi model, that's now gone to 15% VAT. So you will need more money at hand to, to pay your vendors because you will need to, you know, pay over that 5% to them. Yes, you will get it back once you do your, your VAT return, but the funds need to be available. That 5% needs to be there for you to meet the payments that you need to make to your vendors. And of course, things like payment terms might then become quite important. So obviously from the procurement side, you wanna be paying as, as late as possible. That makes sense. But that also now has the added benefit of you pay your VAT to your vendor a bit later. This is more important when we talk about sales. Your, your credit terms are absolutely critical when it comes to sales. So the way that VAT works is that when you make a sale, your obligation to pay that VAT over to the authorities that month will be crystallized if for that sale, you have issued an invoice, 
or you have delivered the product, or you've received cash, whichever is earliest. So what might happen is, let's say on the 31st of January, you might issue an invoice for a sale, but you might not get paid for another three or four or five months. But the authorities will expect you to pay the VAT on that sale in the following month when you do your VAT return. So you're now funding that VAT because your customer has not paid you for a long time. So again, we come back to the cash flow impact. You need to think about have I arranged my cash flow in a way that, yes, on the procurement side, I can meet my payments, but also on the sales side, that somehow I can make up for the fact that perhaps my customers are not paying me very, very quickly. And of course, at the moment for many businesses, that's quite an issue. I would say the first thing that, that businesses really need to think about is compliance. You know, ultimately, the whole course of VAT preparation is for the purpose of filing a VAT return every month. Now, of course, getting your procurement lined up, getting your sales lined up, getting your IT lined up, your processes and your people are all in that purpose of preparing your business to file every month. So you also need to prepare what that filing procedure is gonna look like. You may want to outsource it, you may want to insource it. If you're going to insource it, you need to think about you know, how do I transform my current finance team into being a fully fledged tax team that can meet my filing obligations every month? Do I need to provide them some sort of training? Do I need to invest in some sort of software? Do we need to create processes? Uh, you know, because ultimately, misfiling or errors in filing are quite significantly penalized in the VAT world. Because remember, it's a self assessed tax. So the, the obligation is on the taxpayer to correctly assess. And if you're unable to correctly assess, then the issue there becomes, if that's then come to light, there could be penalties and the rest. And the key compliance issue in the UAE was that uh, businesses were in some cases unable to get their invoices correct. So when you issue an invoice for your sale, that must be VAT compliant. And if it's not, then you could run into quite significant penalties because if you've issued an invoice wrong once, probably you've issued it wrong multiple times. So that's really an area to focus on. Now, there are plenty of other areas, which I won't go into detail just now, but just to highlight, you know, there could be an impact on your remuneration policy. There could be an impact on your uh, investor, customer, uh, vendor relations. There could be an impact on your overall structure as a business because of the way that that's, uh, that works. So getting ready for VAT is, is quite a time consuming exercise. And I'd say for a smaller business, yes, perhaps three to six months. A medium-sized business, yes, perhaps six to 12 months. Uh, and larger businesses, you know, that they, in our experience, those have run, uh, you know, longer than a year. So happy to take questions at the end, but for now I'll hand over to Lamia to take you through the update for excise tax. Hi everyone, so I hope this uh, excise tax will be as sweet as the, the tax that's applied to it. So, um, Excise tax is a tax specifically on goods which are normally seen as harmful to the individual health or the environment. And the goods are uh, including tobacco and tobacco derivative at 100%, carbonated drinks at 50%, energy drinks at 100%, and special purposes goods which includes alcohol and pork uh, products at 100%. But this special purposes goods can be extended in the future. So we might have other goods. And as we all saw on the news, alcohol were reduced to 50% and then was increased back at 100% again, uh, which was in July. <clears throat> as we all saw that the effect that happened in uh, July last year, the increase of the prices of these things, uh, there is an expansion that will happen in October and similar to what happened in uh, UAE and uh, KSA which included sweetened drinks and electronic devices and uh, the tools that used for smoking and piping and similar activities. Also the liquids which are used for these electronic devices. This tax also levied on uh, uh, companies who import these goods or the companies who release, let's say manufacture or released uh, from their tax warehouse. Um, we'll move to the next slide. I'll just give you a simple background of the timeline. So we had KCNUA in Bahrain implemented excise tax in 2017. 
moved on in 2019, 2019 we had Oman and Bahrain and Qatar applying um, the excise tax. Similarly, what I said uh, previously, the expansion of KSA and UAE happened in 2019. And similarly, Oman will levy uh, the expansion on sweetened drinks only uh, in October 2020. <clears throat> uh, Kuwait, we expect to uh, levy the tax on 2021. So I will go through the expansion that's going to happen in October, which will affect all of us. Um, <clears throat> it will be on carbonate, uh, it will be on sweetened drinks, um, juices, uh, carbonated juices. So it's, we have an example like uh, the cans that we have, like, um, uh, it's slipped my mind right now. Let's say uh, vitamin C, that's carbonated drink. Uh, let's say if you have an uh, orange juice, like, uh, tank if it's uh, carbonated, but that's not carbonated. But we have like tank powder, um, Vimto, all these type of drinks. If you have a coffee which has a syrup, um, hazelnut, people like that, uh, caramel, all these type of drinks that we drink currently will all have this excise tax. Drinks that we buy from, um, for example, Fun Juice, uh, Juice World, all this type of drinks will have uh, excise tax, unless if it's natural without any added sugar. And the percentage will be 50% on it. And on October, the night of October 1st, 2020, you will have to, uh, all the companies who produce these drinks will have to file a return, a transitional return on the 15th of October. So there'll be a stock count on the 30th of September on the stock that they have, uh, the syrups that they have and the sugar that they have or the drinks, the powder or jelly, on the, they have to file a return on the 15th of October, 2020. <clears throat> and that will be on the selling price that the company used. If it's uh, the standard price of the tax authority is higher, then that will be taken into consideration and the excise tax will be on that one. This will be applied to the persons who produce or import, as I said before, released for consumption, hold for sale, uh, for commercial service uh, purposes, or if you have a tax warehouse uh, license for non-carbonated sweetened drinks. Uh, these people will have to file a quarterly return uh, starting from October. And then this will be an exception for 100% natural juice, uh, milk substitute, even baby milk would be included milk-based drinks uh, that contain 75 percent uh, uh, milk, natural supplements, drink intended for special natural or medical use. I hope that covers most of the things but we will also uh, get your questions if you have around that. So we'll start your questions. We can start now. Thank you. So you know thank you very much to my colleagues for having covered uh, the topics and uh, we are open for uh, questions uh, now. Uh, you know, one last point which I thought I'll just uh, highlight is that see, Majlis Shura uh, got extended to approve the two uh, tax laws. Uh, that itself is quite unprecedented. Uh, you know, there was a 30 day uh, extension of the session uh, just to approve two tax laws. One was the income tax law amendment and the second one was the VAT law. So that kind of gives you a flavor of, uh, you know, where uh, we are heading towards, uh, you know, from a, from a tax perspective. That also kind of gives you uh, that how important it is for the government to get through these uh, royal decrees passed. So we'll pause here. Uh, please, happy to take questions uh, uh, from, from the audience. Thank you very much. And first, I would like to apologize for the inconvenience caused by one of the ex-participants. Uh, we shall start now with the Q&A session with our guests. <coughs> Please feel free to type Q in the chat or use the raise hand option. Uh, we will start with uh, Mr. Simon Karam. Mr. Simon, please go ahead. Thank you very much, the panel. You know, on, on uh, these uh, Majlis al khunji sessions are on a holiday. Uh, they are Saturday. Uh, and, and the audience is, is quite varied. Uh, I don't want to say that you 
made us worry, worry with all these taxes, but we learned quite a lot. Um, I have some comments and then some questions, if I may. You did say that deficit is not a bad thing, fine. As long as we find people to finance it, the international community to finance it. You, I mean, I would like to continue that statement. You know, if you are borrowing to pay a deficit for salaries is one thing. And if you are borrowing uh, to, for developing the economy is another thing, I think. So it's not always that the deficit is, is a good or bad thing, depending on, on what you're using the money for. That's, that's what I, uh, the, second, the second thing, uh, you know, the, the question that I have, so the VAT ultimately will be over and above the corporate tax, I suppose, or will one take the place of the other? So, you know, Simon, uh, thank you very much for both those, both. so the but first comment, a, of course. And... But I have a third one, but, but I want oh, you yes. to answer that, yeah, it's over and above, yeah. Is it over and above? Uh, yes, it is. It is over and above. So how okay. I will explain it is uh, that you know this is not a tax of the business. Yeah. So you know if I if I was to simplify it, uh, let's say I have a company and I call it uh, Company A LLC. The Company A LLC is buying products or manufacturing products and selling these goods uh, to people uh, who are consuming it. So when I'm buying it, let's say if I bought something at eight reals and I sold something at 10, I have made a profit of two. So on that profit of two, I apply corporate income tax. Yes, when yes, we introduce, yes, yeah, when we introduce VAT, we will be now charging VAT it's on the 10 real it's price. Yeah. So it is over and above that, but this tax is paid by the end consumer, you know, by an individual who's consuming it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the exactly. companies are just the collecting agents for the government. Yeah, yeah. you see, one would have thought uh, that how are we doing with the present tax system? And we are not doing so good at all. When you think that you have uh, 311,000 uh, CRs, commercial registration in the, and, and uh, I sent this data on, 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 on our group today, and you have 120,000 of them only who are registered with the Ministry of Commerce and Industry. And out of these, I do not think there's more than 5,000 out of the 120,000 who pay tax, corporate tax. Uh, is it not, I mean, you said you said the figure, I mean, the corporate is about 500 million riyals a year without the withholding tax. The banks pay 60% of this, I think, maybe more. So really, really, we are not collecting properly the, uh, the corporate tax. And, uh, and, and I think uh, your figures, they tell you, you know, I'm, I mean, I made a little research, not research at all, just guess, estimate. If we implemented properly the, uh, the corporate tax, we can increase the income, we can double the 500 million become a billion reals. How did I base that? It's very, well, quite, quite uh, pragmatic going from the GDP, how much profit on that. And if you calculate 15%, you reach something of that order. So before uh, teaching people how to comply, that's the word that your team love to, you know, use, which is good, to comply with VAT, why don't we put a system first immediately now to see how we can improve collection on corporate taxes? Um, because, because the era where government pays, pays, I hope is not going to stay long. We want every one of us to do his work and pay his duties so that the country may survive, whether there's oil or whether there is no oil. Uh, so these are the two things that I wanted to, oh, 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 sorry, that I so, wanted you to comment on, yeah, thank yeah, you. So just, uh, just a quick comment on that, uh, Simon. So, so one is that, uh, you know, there are about 
hundred and uh, hundred thousand odd taxpayers who are registered with the uh, Ministry of Finance with the tax authority. And there are 40,000 taxpayers who end up paying, uh, you know, some sort of taxes. Uh, it can be, you know, let's say from 100, re ranging from 100 real to, uh, you know, uh, 50 uh, million Omani real. So there is a wide range uh, of, of, you know, payments. In uh, so 2007, you reckon there are 40, sorry, so you reckon there are 40,000 files? 40,000 taxpayers who pay tax uh, in, the, in the country. Yeah, uh, okay. So it can be 100 real or it can be, you know, 50 million real. So depending on... Or zero real if they are losing. Uh, yes, or zero as well. Uh, so, so you know, in 2017, a major amendment was introduced in the income tax law. So the point that you made, Simon, was absolutely spot on. But earlier, you know, companies were not paying taxes. So you had the famous, uh, you know, 30,000 real tax exempt limit. Uh, anybody who reported profit before below 30,000 never paid tax. Anybody who had profit above 30,000 paid 12%. In 2017, that 30,000 limit got removed. So now, even if a company made a hundred real profit, theoretically, they would have to pay 15 real tax. So that amendment expanded the tax base quite a lot. And, you know, the comment that I made just before I was concluding my session was that, uh, you know, if more taxpayers paid their fair share of taxes to the government, the government could overall reduce the tax rate from 15% and make it 10%. Because, you know, then you have got an expanded base where more people are contributing towards the nation building, which is, you know, paying their fair share of tax. So, uh, you know, I, I would say largely uh, companies, it's not that they don't want to comply. It is that there is a lot of still lack of awareness around what all needs to be done. And that is what the government is now doing by introducing uh, you know, electronic coordinated digital systems between the Ministry of Commerce, Ministry of Labor, Ministry of Finance, so that, you know, you can now share data more easily, uh, you know, between them. Uh, and then, you know, taxpayers can be encouraged to start uh, complying with, uh, with taxes. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will move to Mr. Mike Hansen. Mr. Mike, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, Reham. Uh, thank you, Alkesh, and to uh, your colleagues. Excellent uh, presentation on the Oman tax landscape as it is now and how it's likely to change. Uh, thank you, Mr. Khalil, for this uh, forum of Majlis al -Konji. I have two questions, please. <clears throat> the first one relates to, and they, they both relate to your, I thought, important comment about the three C's and listening to you, I, I wrote down four C's. <laughs> so the first one was, you said that tax is not necessarily bad, but earlier on in your opening, it's clearly an essential for a modern and future society and community. So it's a partner. So tax, you said, <clears throat> needs to be carefully with clarity, consistently, and with certainty applied. So my two questions, please. The first one, it sounds like tax in Oman from listening to you and your colleagues. I thought they were, they were all great. Mihir, Saeed, Mittal, Lamia. But it seems like we're going to have <clears throat> a better tax environment, not necessarily for the individual or the corporate, more tax. It sounds like uh, that direct tax and how it's been applied might be giving way to consumption tax. And that's a whole different era and with more governance uh, and regulation. So I'm interested on this first point. What are the top factors needed here in Oman in the next, for example, 24 months to line up our authoritative and regulatory bodies um, that will dictate the timing of changes and application to tax policy and of paying tax bills going forward. So I'm thinking about things like compliance, so the tax control framework, legislation, transparency, big data, these points. 
But being, being a Brit, um, I have to ask the second question, please. And that's about excise duty. <laughs> and remembering the four C's, carefully, clarity, consistently, and with certainty. Because I've, I'm seeing the application of excise duty <clears throat> related to some products, and you can guess straight away which one product I would be interested in as a Brit. Yes. And I'm seeing that the application of the rates and the severity affects me, number one, in much lower value quality products. <laughs> and number two, on some sectors, particularly hospitality and food, I'm seeing the disappearance of one category of food completely because of the elasticity of demand and the aggressive application of the tax <clears throat> that whatever was collected from whoever consumed has now, is now lost. One. Number two, if you own a hotel, and I've seen the accounts of many hotels, but the component of the first category is pretty high, that the sustainability, continuity, the loss of jobs that are likely to come from this current application, I wouldn't want to own a hotel. But my question is, how does an individual, a Brit concerned about the first product, or an Omani businessman and his hotels, how do they appeal? How do they represent the individual or the sector and its contribution to the wider economy? So if I may ask, please. Sure, so thank you very much, Mike, uh, for those uh, comments and, uh, and questions. So, you know, when you, uh, so I'll, I'll take the first question, uh, which is, you know, revolving around the big data and, you know, technology mm -hmm. and how best can, uh, you know, this whole thing get, uh, get, you know, channelized and rolled out. So, you know, when we uh, look at taxation, uh, we look at three uh, very important components. So the first one is, you know, the legislation, the law itself, uh, you know, because that, that becomes your rule book uh, for the authority to, you know, implement it in the, in the economy. So, so your legislation needs to be modern and the legislation needs to be, uh, you know, addressing uh, the needs of the economy and the needs of the sector. So what we are seeing now is there is a lot of impetus being put in to modernize the uh, income tax law. So, you know, the, I mean, since I've been practicing this, so I can, I can talk more about this. So in 1981 was when you had the income tax law. Before that, all what you had was, you know, a, a, a very two page, a small two to four page rule book which was designed to address, uh, you know, the large oil companies who came here to do the drilling activity in the 70s because they wanted a tax certificate. So we used to give one tax certificate. Uh, in 81, you had the law. And then in 91, you introduced uh, corporate income tax on, uh, you know, local businesses. And then you amended the law only in 2010. So from 81 to 2010, you had one law for 30 years. In 2010 law got amended in 2017 and 2017 amendment is now again getting amendment in 2020. So you can see the speed at which the legislative reforms are taking place. So, you know, this is allowing us, uh, the government to modernize the legislative system as far as the tax law is concerned. When you talk about the second most important thing, which is the ERP or the technology uh, at the back end, which enables the government to introduce or administer or, you know, monitor the, uh, the legislation on taxation. So three years back, uh, the government completely uh, digitized itself. It, it appointed an Estonian company to, you know, help uh, with uh, the ERP software, which allows the tax authority to administer it. Many were wondering that why are we talking about an Estonian company doing it? Uh, many don't know in Estonia is one of the most advanced, digitally advanced tax uh, society in the whole of EU uh, and in Europe, where uh, uh, an individual can file a tax return uh, using a mobile uh, through, uh, through an SMS. Uh, so it is that advanced. Uh, so, you know, the tax authority appointed an Estonian company to develop 
a full scale ERP system, which allows online filing and all of that. So there is a lot of modernization happening on the, uh, on the, uh, you know, the ERP side. The third most important critical element of a legal system or a tax system is its people. And, you know, how well can it train its people? Uh, so, you know, I have been in regular, I was in very regular discussions with His Excellency Sultan al as well as His Excellency Saud Nasr al uh, on what all can be done in order to train uh, the tax inspectors uh, and, you know, open their minds and expose them to, uh, you know, how uh, tax laws are administered, how they should be looking at, uh, you know, the various aspects of the income tax law, understanding how business functions so that when they are issuing assessments and interacting, they are able to then, you know, uh, take the business uh, considerations into mind before being very harsh with the taxpayers. So, you know, modernization, training, uh, and uh, modernization of the law are the key elements. And in the next 24 months, uh, you know, there are two, three things which I would uh, you know, take as, uh, you know, points for suggestion to the uh, Ministry of Finance and the Tax Authority is, you know, one is, uh, you know, increase the level of communication uh, with the taxpayers. Uh, you know, ensure that you create a partnership uh, between the taxpayers and the regulatory body, not necessarily projecting it as a, you know, government which, uh, you know, is, uh, it, it does what it does and it does not, uh, you know, factor into the uh, concerns or the issues of the taxpayer. So, you know, take the uh, taxpayer in confidence with all what you're doing uh, in, in the future. You will then have a lot more buy-in and a lot more collaborative approach to all these legislative changes. Like, for example, uh, you know, on this call, we are having a lot of businessmen who are there. Uh, you know, the government, the tax authority should create a platform where it interacts with the businessmen to say that, see, this is what we're doing uh, from a tax policy perspective. Uh, how do you think uh, you can support and you can uh, contribute? We would like to hear your feedback. So, you know, ensure that a platform is created where feedback can be provided, that feedback can then be put into, uh, you know, the laws and the laws then get developed through a consultative approach as opposed to just a one directional approach. This is what happens in most of the developed economies. You know, laws get debated, the laws get, uh, you know, discussed, and then, uh, you know, the the whole there is a there is a uh, I would say a cooling off period that is provided of 12 months, where a consultation happens with business leaders, with uh, various forums. Their feedback is then taken into consideration. Appropriate amendments go into the law, and then the law gets finalized. So you know, I think that kind of an approach will do a lot better for the businesses. Uh, going forward, because then their voices get heard. Uh, I think that would be uh, a good development, I would say, for the future. Thank you. Uh, so, Mike, coming to your second question, which was uh, around the excise tax and, you know, the impact of it on the business. Uh, you know, if we introduced excise tax uh, and the whole region ignored excise tax, I would be very concerned because then, you know, we are sticking our neck out and doing things which is very, very counterintuitive or counter uh, the business. Uh, this happened as a GCC uh, you know, union uh, decision. This decision was taken in 2015, 16, when you know, we did have a small bit of oil crisis happening across the region. And you know, we all wanted to you know, boost our uh, you know, government's uh, collection uh, so that you know, there is a fiscal uh, you know, sustainability as far as the income is concerned. You know, the products which are being taxed Tobacco uh, is one of the most heavily taxed product in the world. And so is alcohol. Uh, because both these uh, products are typically, uh, you know, uh, I would say uh, price inelastic. So, you know, if someone has to consume it, they will consume it. The price point generally does not uh, decide whether to consume or not. Although if it's too high, then people try to choose the cheaper end of the product and when you choose the cheaper end of the product, it has a far more, uh, you know, negative effect on the health. Uh, so, uh, you know, there, there needs to be a balance between uh, what taxation, uh, what amount of taxation is collected out of these products, because you don't want people to start consuming a cheaper alternative, which might be more damaging. I think this is an early period, uh, like what you would expect in any new introduction of tax, there will be a stabilization period 
uh, right now many uh, even the tax authorities are not very clear of how uh, you know what is the impact on consumption patterns as more studies will start coming out of it you will start seeing a more cohesive approach towards uh, taxing these products when you come to the hospitality and the hotel industries i completely agree with you that there is a huge uh, initial uh, hit onto the demand for those products but then as time progresses you know it it kind of uh, you know reaches a plateau and then it starts uh, you know uh, the impact of it starts weaning down we experienced this in uae like uh, you know the vat was introduced the first quarter of 2018 the car sales plummeted to its lowest ever in the history from a historical quarter perspective whereas the quarter before that which was the september october to december of 2017 they reported the highest sale ever yeah so you had uh, perhaps you know 10 times more than what you would expect so but thereafter the demand and you know it started picking up the demand supply you know starts rebalancing itself and you then start seeing you know as a steady decline of the impact of this tax on the demand uh, so i think it's a uh, it's too early for us to uh, you know uh, brand it as ineffective i think we'll have to wait and see uh, by the way oman is uh, you know we have not been very creative in naming these taxes as the british have been uh, so you know in oman we call it excise tax uh, but in in uk we have sugar tax yeah so uh, you know <laughs> uh, so the amount of sugar in a particular drink decides what is the percentage of the tax that is applied onto it so uh, this is across the globe yeah it is applied everywhere uh, and we are the G, the gcc region is only now just realigning itself uh, to how uh, taxation works across the globe for us who have lived here for 30 plus years in this economy uh, we've been used to a very low or no tax environment when suddenly we are being asked to pay tax into onto almost everything that we consume there is natural uh, resistance towards it but i think uh, over the next 2 to 3 years you will start seeing things balancing it out a lot more uh, you know to a palatable level than where it is today those are two very good answers thank you very much okesh uh, thank you just a little intervention we don't want to hijack the meeting so therefore lamia may answer that First October, all the GCC countries will follow the same, the same excise tax, because that's our real, yeah. our real problem. We compete for tourism. We compete for so many things. Are they going to adopt all of them, the six, the same rule? No, it's just Oman. Uh, UAE and KC already started last year in December, so only Oman will start on first October on the sweetened drinks. No, but about alcohol. I thought already last year we started in July last year Lambia, which was on 50% yeah, the So what's country. going what's going to happen in October and are we as Mike is saying above or below the others No the or same No I thought uh, yeah. it's not it's not the same yeah. well, One thing I'd add is um you know naturally there isn't alcohol in Saudi so their law doesn't address uh, excise on on alcohol yeah, yeah in UAE alcohol, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well officially in yeah, UAE no, um, officially there is in King <laughs> Abdul, Abdul, there is the first bar was opened about 9 months ago okay okay i'm happy to be corrected there uh, but if we look at the UAE law um, specifically on alcohol no Uh, but i think that they are addressing it through other hotel and tourism related taxes so to answer your question uh, on a direct tax to tax comparison you would say it's it's potentially not a level playing field uh, but then the uae you know model is to tax through other taxes other levies so if i can also add uh, simon uh, to your question uh, this was a gcc agreement that was signed between all the six states except kuwait all the other five countries have implemented or have issued legislation for excise tax the amendment which we are talking about now from 1st of october is adding the adding more products which will be now subject to excise these products have already been introduced uh, in uh, ksa uh, bahrain and in uae uh, you know about 6 months back Uh, six to eight months back oman is only uh, now introducing it in october so you know when the excise tax was introduced last year we had 3000 uh, 
uh, SKUs or 3000 products which were subject to excise tax at different percentage, so 50%, 100% likewise. That list of 3000 products has now become 30,000 products because of naturally, once you uh, say that I'm going to tax anything that has sugar in it, uh, your number of products which are subject to tax expands. Uh, so, so the sugary drinks like the sweetened milk and juices and everything else is also subject to excise tax in UAE and in KSA and everywhere else. So, but in UAE, the uh, the taxation on the alcohol is a little bit different. So, you know, UAE has got a very high import duty on 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 alcohol compared to uh, you know what uh, what Oman has. So, you know, they are collecting taxes, but in a different way. What also needs to be uh, kept at the back of the mind is that this is a tax on the ultimate selling price. So, uh, you know, the way it is implemented is very different uh, in each of the jurisdiction. And that is what is making uh, that price arbitrage a little bit look very skewed. Uh, you know, so that element is now being addressed. Uh, last year, when excise tax on alcohol was introduced, it was only at 50%. It became 100% from 1st of July this year. Uh, so when it was at 50%, it was the total tax impact on the product was lower than what it was in UAE. But in UAE, the volume is so big that the profit uh, margins are reduced, and therefore the prices are, uh, you know, kept at a at a lower level compared to here. Here, the volume is not that big as as you can imagine uh, compared to UAE. So, so there is a difference in how the whole thing is being rolled out. I, you know, for, for us as consultants and advisors, we love to talk so we can go on as long as uh, uh, you guys are uh, okay with it. So, you know, Riyam and uh, Mike, uh, Mr. Khalil, I would, I will uh, be guided by you as to, you know, how many questions can we take? So thank you. Uh, I'm happy thank to take. You. Yeah, we have uh, another question. Sorry, Mr. Kishore is waiting from long time. So Mr. Kishore, please go ahead. Mr. Hemant, I'll come back to you. Thank you. Uh, Thank, th thank you. Thank you, Alukesh and your team. It was a very uh, um, uh, knowledgeable session. I could uh, understand the tax landscape quite clearly. My question is about the consumption tax, that is the VAT tax that will come in. Um, as as uh, we can imagine, the IT infrastructure required for implementing uh, all these sectors from compliance to procurement to sales and marketing would be quite uh, uh, quite large. So how do you, I, I'm sure when it is getting implemented, there would be lots of companies who fall into the gambit of uh, the ambit of tax, the VAT tax for above $100,000, but they may not have the infrastructure to manage it. So this would create a very large uh, imbalance for a period of time. Your experiences in UAE and other countries, how did this imbalance settled down? How long did it take? How did it impact others? My second question is, uh, I'm from the construction industry, the building services industry. Uh, uh, Mithul made a statement that uh, VAT will be implemented if you receive cash, if you invoice, or if you deliver a product. So in our case, we get advances and sometimes we get retentions which may come up after two years and you have a cash imbalance or a cash flow negative scenario in, in many projects, especially the government projects, we are always cash flow negative and it probably reaches a state of neutrality at the end of the project. So under such circumstances, do you still pay tax, the VAT tax for the three segments that is received cash, invoiced items or delivered product? Mithil, go ahead with the answer for both those questions and I'll, I'll chip in sure. with my comments, please. So, so in terms of the first one, which is around, you know, the procedures around things like IT to get ready, I think in the UAE, we still have businesses today who we're working with who are getting their IT ready. So that's, a, you know, a two-year program and they're still doing that. But in the main, what happened was uh, most dedicated accounting software wasn't ready on the exact date of implementation in UAE and they came out with more and more patches. Uh, and those sort of, uh, you know, the middle market tends to use the sort of more, more basic accounting software. And for most businesses, it was okay because they didn't have that many different type of products. So they could just say, okay, if I sell this product, I will just hard code that product to always be 5% VAT. 
So that was okay for businesses that largely had a domestic-based customer set. And the, uh, you know, the, uh, the mid-marking accounting systems were, in the end, quite well geared up for that. And the benefit for Oman is that what we do for some of our clients in Oman who use those softwares from UAE is, you know, we can say to the, the software company, please make this available to our client in Oman so they can test their transactions to see if it works. For the more complicated ERPs like SAP and Oracle, it is a much more complex uh, readiness timeline. It can take a very long time because specifically, one thing that you have to look at is your master data. And when it comes to VAT, there's a few bits of master data that are really critical. So your vendor records, your customer records, your product list, your services list, all of these things have to be set up very well in order to automate VAT in those systems. So actually we spend a lot of time with clients cleaning up the master data. Uh, one of the key issues that we find is master data, particularly for vendors, is sometimes managed by the vendor themselves. And there's not like a correction procedure to make sure it's all correct. So I would say that for, for accounting software standalone, we have a lot pre-ready from UAE. You just need to test your transactions. For the larger ERPs, you do need to build things into there. But before you do that, you need to go through your master data cleanup. Construction and VAT is, is a very, very complex area. If we just take retention, for example, Bahrain, UAE, and Saudi all have different rules on how you account for VAT on retention payments, which means for Oman, we're in a, a bit of a, a mix on which will be the rule that's used. You know, in, in, in Saudi, the way it works is, you know, let's say that you make monthly payments and you have a retention amount. In Saudi, as the construction company, you need to issue an invoice to your customer for the full amount. You don't deduct the retention and you apply VAT on the full amount, right? So over the course of the contract, all the VAT is collected and you can go into a retention period, but the tax authorities are very happy because at the day that the building is completed, they've received all the VAT because you can't deduct the retention from the amount that you're gonna apply VAT upon for the milestone. Of course, in UA and Bahrain, they've done it differently. So in Bahrain, for example, you'll take your milestone payment, you will remove anything you're going to retain, and you apply that on what remains, which then builds in the complexity that once the building is completed, not all the VAT has been accounted yet because you haven't applied VAT on the retention. So they give you one year, a maximum of one year, to then issue an invoice for the balance retention amount. So you could have one year after the building completed, that the VAT is all accounted for. So we have brought this to the attention to, of the tax authorities uh, in Amman, and we have said, you know, this is quite a significant area uh, that we need clarity upon. Uh, it could be very large sums of money and very large sums of tax that are, that are implicated here. So it's on the radar, uh, we're yet to hear feedback, uh, but certainly we'd expect that similar to UAE, Bahrain, KSA, uh, you know, Oman would get its own guide for real estate. Uh, and we've actually provided some 20 to 25 odd points specific to real estate. We brought that to the attention of the authorities. So, uh, you know, there is a little bit of action there, hopefully. Um, no, so, so just to add one more, Mithul. Um, the work in progress. Work in progress is another aspect in construction, wherein uh, you actually invoice and the consulting engineer or the uh, end customer deem that invoice may be incorrect and he reduces the value of the invoice. So how do you handle that sort of a scenario? You have already invoiced the customer and he decides yeah. it is not say X amount, it is less. So you pay based on your invoice and later on adjust? Yeah, so the way it happens is if that, if all of that happens in the same month, uh, it's a little bit easy because you can just issue a tax credit note which will then reduce by that amount how much VAT you need to pay over. It becomes a bit tricky when it's different periods because you might issue the credit note in the next reporting period and then the way that you adjust that might be different. You might need to adjust that through the adjustment section of the VAT return, which basically then gives the headache to your tax team to say, if it's in the same month, just reduce the output VAT. That's quite simple with a tax credit note. If it's in a different month, then they need to go through the procedure of making a formal adjustment on the VAT return, which is a separate box. So they need to populate that one, keep a record. So it's a bit more of a compliance heading. Thank, thanks, Mithul. Thanks very much.
Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Himan, please go ahead. Yeah, my question is for uh, Mithul. Uh, I'm from the education sector, and uh, I heard Mithul saying that uh, VAT will not be applied to the education sector, which uh, means my understanding is that we won't build this to our parents for the educational fees, but we yeah. will end up paying uh, VAT to our suppliers when we are buying uh, local uh, items or services. So that in, in, a, in a nutshell, that would be a cost to my business. So absolutely. is my understanding correct? That's absolutely correct. So if they decide that education is going to be VAT exempt in Oman, then yes, all the VAT that you incur uh, will not be creditable. You will not get that back. That becomes an absolute cost. However, one positive thing is you know, through the comments provided by the Majlis al Shura, um, through certain amendments that happened to the law before it went to the Shura, we think that then there's a strong chance now that education and educational products, so goods and services related to education, may be zero rated, which is a big positive. So that's what they've done in UAE, which means that if they're zero rated, whilst you're not going to charge the VAT, or you do charge VAT just at zero percent, uh, you can then claim back all the VAT you've incurred on your purchases. So hopefully that bit of the law does get through. Um, you know, a few years back, it did say exempt. And I think now perhaps the verbiage has changed to zero rated. So that would be very positive if that did happen. Okay, well, that's, that, that's good news. Uh, that's good news for us, yeah. Certainly. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Talal. Sorry for letting you uh, in the way. Mm -hmm. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much for the excellent uh, presentations to all the team and thank you to Minister Khunji. I have a uh, quick uh, three points. Um, if, uh, uh, when you mentioned, uh, th there was a very uh, good point that mentions about increasing uh, the tax base to maximize, uh, to maximize the, the, the collections with the, with the less uh, like uh, percentage. Uh, if, if I look to the 2020 uh, budget from the Ministry of Finance, which uh, been announced uh, like uh, in, the, in the beginning of the year, 28% uh, uh, of the revenue uh, is coming from non-oil uh, non uh, revenue. And out of this 28%, 54% is coming just from the taxation. The other, uh, almost like half of the, of, of, of the non-oil revenue is coming from the taxation. I'm just wondering how can we stimulate uh, the market to increase the economic uh, uh, activities for non-oil with the current uh, like uh, uh, very high uh, like uh, uh, non-oil non revenues coming from the taxation connection. Uh, it would be great if you have any like uh, thoughts on it. I'm sure that you are very close from the uh, regulators on, on, on consulting them. Uh, this is my, my first uh, uh, question. My, my second one. I'm coming from the energy sectors. Uh, I practice some of the energy uh, taxation regulation in, in, the, in, in Northern America and in the United States, also in the North, uh, in the North Sea, uh, in Scotland. And what I'm, I'm, I'm quite surprising when I see like uh, uh, one of the critical points it is uh, in the wood holding tax, there is an, a, a line item for R&D, for research and development. And usually, uh, for example, there is a very uh, good uh, federal uh, regulations in the United States in 1981. It was to give uh, a taxation credit for R&D activities that promote more uh, energy efficiency, more uh, uh, generating of energy from uh, with, with less carbon dioxide emission. Uh, I know Oman in the, in, the, in the emission point of view, it is, uh, it's, it's, it's not that sustainable. Uh, there's lots of... Uh, practicing of, of non-healthy energy uh, intensity, especially uh, if you compare it and benchmark it. So uh, is there any way that uh, we think about exception or exemption for the R&D uh, withholding tax, especially focusing in like microgrid or uh, in generating of energy from from better sustainable way? Uh, this is my second question. And, and my third question is, uh, there's a very nice regulations is, uh, is, is established in the, in the, in the, in the New York uh, state, in the, in, the, in, the, in the New York City. It is by uh, having like uh, uh, a taxation reduction in the commercial building, 
for example, uh, 1.8 dollars for every square meter square. If that's proved to be uh, uh, offering energy efficiency, if, if, if the owner of the building demonstrates that he cut, for example, his real estate uh, uh, energy consumption to be more safer, more efficient, he gets a credit for $1.8 for every uh, squ uh, uh, square meters. Those practices of exemption, I'm sure it's, it's will coming as a wave once we just have uh, the mass implementation. But in your vision, since you are close from the regulators, uh, how do you see Oman market responding to that? How do you see the regulators uh, understanding the, the, those global practice, uh, global practice in, in taxation systems, especially in, in, the, in the energy efficiency and uh, in, in the carbon dioxide? Thank you again. Thank you very much for the great and excellent uh, discussion. So, mashallah, Talal, I think uh, you uh, should join uh, the Ministry of Finance and the Tax Authority because uh, some of the ideas that you are sharing are absolutely brilliant. And, uh, you know, this is the kind of uh, conversation which uh, is now happening, uh, you know, at the, at the tax authority. So, so, you know, you asked three questions and I, I will try to trust my memory to remain all, remember all three of them. The first one which you are talking about is, you know, the contribution of taxation to the overall, uh, overall budget. So, you know, now this is a very interesting debate. Uh, across the GCC, uh, we've been, uh, you know, discussing with uh, with all the government. So if you if you understand how the accounting happens, uh, until now the GCC governments were following uh, cash basis of accounting. Yeah. So if you collected cash, uh, then that would get accounted as revenue, and if you paid cash, that would get ex uh, accounted as expense. So you followed the cash basis of accounting. We never followed the accrual. Uh, when you don't follow accrual, you don't have a balance sheet. So when you don't have a balance sheet, you're not able to assess all the assets that you have, right? So, uh, you know, you're following mostly the cash basis. The governments now in the GCC are moving away from cash and coming into accrual. So when you come into accrual, you start looking at that, what are our assets and how much money we are collecting and all of that. So 80, when we say 80% of the revenue comes from oil and gas, what we mean is uh, the underlying source of the income is oil and gas. Out of that 80%, there is about 30%, which is tax on oil, yeah, which uh, the government is now assessing that should really that tax on oil be reported as oil income or should, should it be reported as tax income? Because, uh, you know, when you spoke about the North Oil Blocks and when you spoke about the UK, uh, you, uh, you know, the Scottish uh, tax system, they all account for tax that is collected from the oil uh, from the sale of oil or from the exploration of oil is reported as tax revenue, not as oil revenue. So that is a bit of, you know, cutting the same pie into different sizes and shapes to see where exactly we are heading towards. Uh, taxation uh, per se, uh, as how we look at taxation is, uh, is you know, your corporate income tax and your, uh, we don't have VAT. So you've got corporate income tax, you've got withholding tax, and you've got customs duty. And then you've got your other levies uh, underlying it, such as, you know, the, levy that you pay when you pay, when you renew a rental contract or, you know, the different other levies that you pay. Those levies are very different. They are not, they are not taxation. So taxation, when we are talking about taxation to expand the base, like what, you know, Simon uh, mentioned uh, in his first question that, you know, when you've got 315,000, uh, you know, CRs issued, why is it that only 40,000 taxpayers are paying tax? Shouldn't that 40,000 taxpayers become 100,000 or 200,000? Uh, even if they end up paying, let's say 100 or 200 reals at least, you know, you are contributing towards the overall government collection. So when we're talking about the expansion of the base, what we mean is including more companies into the uh, overall tax paying system. So, you know, educating them more, uh, handholding them more, uh, explaining to them that how by them, them paying taxes, they're contributing to nation building. So I think that level of education is something that is very important to happen. Then, you know, your tax base keeps expanding uh, from where it is. Your second question around, uh, you know, the, uh, the efficiency uh, aspect, the, uh, the energy uh, sector and the energy efficiency. Uh, you know, I think uh, we have focused uh, for too long on, uh, you know, relying on the renew on the non-renewables to fuel our oil fields like for example pdo uh, has just 
two months back uh, opened or inaugurated its first uh, you know solar uh, solar power plant as uh, the government issues more regulations around the uh, you know the solar uh, the renewable sector you will start seeing uh, you know more participation happening and more credits being given so for example if today a real estate landowner who has got a lot of buildings around the city if uh, we were to uh, encourage them to have solar panels at on their roof uh, and then you know start generating energy out of the solar panels uh, we will start considering you know giving them more credit there is a pilot project which is going on at the moment uh, for the uh, public authority to test it uh, once it is successful we will start seeing bylaws get issued we will start seeing regulations get issued as to how this credit mechanism can uh, can you know uh, be introduced so that you start benefiting you start flowing it back for example if you go to germany uh, 80% of its energy consumption is out of renewables uh, there every single house has got panels on the top where they uh, whatever energy uh, is consumed is is for their consumption and they get a credit for having deployed that whatever extra is produced is put back onto the grid and for that also they get paid so as we start getting more and more complex into this you will start seeing more regulations which also uh, support uh, that kind of a uh, that kind of a development to happen in that space thank you very much and uh, wish you all the best inshallah thank you inshallah thank you very much thank you very much um, i think we have covered all the questions so far um, we have reached also to the um, time to end uh, this session as well uh, is there any question uh, from any of our guests just one comment from me before if there is any other question you know i i truly apologize uh, to all of you for having uh, set up a very boring tax seminar in the middle of a long weekend holiday uh, really our intention was not to spoil your <laughs> holiday and and i really hope that i have not uh, made your rest of the day miserable uh, just to just to share with you uh, everything that's going on uh, i would strongly encourage you to please forget about tax after this call and uh, we are available to you any time after uh, you know during the working days as well uh, if you really are struggling to you know spend time on anything and uh, want to get further bored please pick up the phone and give me a call or mithul or any of my colleagues and we will be happy to spoil uh, the rest of that day as well for you <laughs> thank you, thank you, Alkesh, and thank you for your team for all the presentation about the our economy and our taxes and so on. Just to tell you that uh, His Excellency Dr. Uh, Saeed Al-Sukhri sent me a message uh, thanking you all, guys, uh, that this is a, a, a timely, uh, you know, presentation, and uh, he been following this, or he will follow on the YouTube because, as you know, all our uh, lectures are uh, broadcast uh, fixed yeah pro broadcast on on the youtube so so definitely within 24 hours it will be there and we hope uh, that uh, uh, bigger audience will will benefit from from yeah. this good Inshallah. luck to everyone thank you can, can and, i can i can yes, i make yes. a little uh, a little commercial break for yeah. majlis al khinji of course <laughs> over the years as you have seen mr Mr. Joshi, uh, the Majlis Khunji has become the platform, the meeting place, the communication hub, where speakers from various countries, from various backgrounds and various disciplines come to expose their views on economy, education, health, tourism, NGOs, finance, heritage, urban development, and taxation. Now, an interesting feature is always the presence of women in our Majlis al Khunji. You see today with Lamia and Rehab, you know, this is just, you know, they're always with us. Another feature is the legendary gen generosity of the Al Khunji family in terms of Makbula, Madruba, Dango. We are now investigating a drone delivery to all of these culinary delicacies to those who join us online. So please be informed that maybe we will deliver you some of this online. Thank you. And thank you for the team. Thank you, Ernst and Young. Thank you, Mr. Joshi and his team. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.